Let me just say a quick thank you to Daniel Lim and, of course, uh, to our whole worship team. Daniel uh, is that's the original song of his. Uh, you don't, may not know this. He, wor- he leads worship on Saturday night occasionally here, but he's part of a band called Daniel and the Sparrows. And Anton, our own Anton, is one of the Sparrows. Isn't that funny? So anyway, if you're interested, they're, they're fantastic. We're grateful for them. We're very grateful for, uh, grateful for your gifts and your leadership as we lift our hearts and voices to the Lord. Let's seek him one more time before we open God's word together. Father God, you are good and gracious and sovereign over all things, and you're present here with us by your spirit. And we acknowledge that your word is true because you've told us it's living and active, sharper than a double-edged sword. It's able to divide even our own thoughts and intentions. We don't always like that, but we need it. And so we pray, Lord Jesus, you who are the living word, to speak to us through your written word. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, we're in a summer series. If you've been, maybe like my family, summer is a disjointed time. You're coming and going. Maybe you have been tracking with us. And on that note, you can catch up on all the sermons you may have missed on the Chapel Street Church app or online. Uh, but we're in a series called The Disciplines of Grace. Those biblical and historical practices of Christians throughout the years that have helped us walk in, experience, and live out of the grace of Jesus in our lives. And the discipline we're going to talk about this morning is one that is really at the center of our faith. The whole thing hinges on the discipline of forgiveness. I mean, it's right there in the Lord's Prayer. Maybe you grew up praying this. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. If you grew up saying the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. What does that mean to believe in the forgiveness of sins? There's no question that we are commanded to forgive as followers of Jesus. It's not optional. In fact, forgiveness, forgiving others along with serving others and being generous with what we have are the three litmus tests that pop up over and over again in the Gospels for how you know that you're walking in the grace of Jesus. If you can't forgive, if you can't serve, and if you can't be generous, that's a pretty good indication that your heart is not open to the grace of God. And at the center of our faith is this idea that we've been forgiven everything. It's a beautiful ideal. A couple of New Testament passages from the Apostle Paul, Ephesians 4, 32. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, as God in Christ forgave you. We have that, Ephesians 4, 32 in Colossians? Maybe not. It's in the Bible. <laughs> and Colossians chapter 3, speaking of, oh, there it is, boom. Ask and you shall receive. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you have a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you. It sounds great, doesn't it? Forgive as God has forgiven you. Be kind and compassionate, tenderhearted. The kind of thing you might stencil on a piece of reclaimed barn wood and put on Pinterest. Hang in your mantle, hang on your, in your entryway. Forgiving, it's a good thing to forgive others. Be gracious, be kind, be nice. It sounds wonderful. C.S. Lewis once said in an essay on forgiveness, everyone thinks forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something very hard to forgive. Or to put it this way, I believe in forgiveness when I need it. It's a little harder when I need to give it or extend it. When you put a specific name on it, when you put a specific wound or hurt on it, forgiveness maybe isn't quite so lovely. A little more challenging. Years ago, I led, when I was the youth pastor here, Tom is now, I, I'm feeling older and older because Tom was a student, wasn't even a student when I was youth pastor. That tells you how young he is and how old I am. Yes, right, just missed him. Uh, so anyway, Pastor Sterling was the youth pastor after me, and now Tom is, is taking it areas we couldn't take it. But I used to lead trips to the south side of Chicago in the Roseland community, a rough area. And one of the things we would do is work with the program there to re- remodel and rehab uh, abandoned houses to be given to underprivileged families, under-resourced families. And what they did is the men in their recovery program would live in these homes for free uh, as, they, as they worked on rehabbing the homes. One of the guys who was kind of a poster child for recovery in this, this ministry center was a guy named Otis. Loved Jesus and worked with our teams. And uh, we really, our kids loved him. He told great stories about life in the, in the hood, in the inner city. And we worked on this house for a couple of years, and then we went back one year, and I talked with Reverend Tony, and Otis wasn't around. I said, where's Otis? He said, oh, Brother Jeff, Otis had a relapse. 
He stripped that house you worked on of everything of value and sold it for drug money, and we haven't seen him. I was so angry. I'm like, we worked on that. Our church gave money for that. We, we did that for two years. And Reverend Tony seemed to be like, well, you know, it happens. And I asked him once on that trip, I said, how do you deal with that? How do you just let that roll off your back like that? He said, I learned a long time ago, if you're going to love broken people, you're going to get burned. You're going to get hurt. It's just going to happen. <laughs> He's right. Again, to quote Lewis, C.S. Lewis in his book, The Four Loves, says, to love it all is to make yourself vulnerable. To love truly, your heart may be stepped on, wrung, even broken. Loving your neighbor is risky business. So the bad news is people are going to hurt you. Pastor Roger, who passed away a number of years ago, used to say people should be better than they are, but they're not. <laughs> so the bad news is people are going to hurt you, but the good news is God invented this thing called forgiveness. But there's a lot of misunderstanding and baggage related to what forgiveness actually is. So before we dive into what the Bible says forgiveness is, I want to talk to you just briefly about what forgiveness is not. Because I, in my work as a pastor, I've heard a lot of misunderstandings that causes a lot of deep spiritual wounds by our misunderstanding of what forgiveness isn't. So let me give you a little list here. First of all, forgiveness is not ignoring the offense. It doesn't mean pretending you're not hurt. Now, no question, we live in a culture of the easily offended today. I mean, it's, everyone's offended all the time about everything, and it's difficult to, net, to know from one week to the next what's going to be offensive. And as Christians, we should not be easily offended people. We should not be the kind of people who carry long records of, of, of grudges or wrongs against us, and we should be the kind of person who gives the benefit of the doubt, who believes the best about those, and we shouldn't be easily offended. But that does not mean there aren't real wrongs and real hurts and real offenses. There are. And forgiveness, biblical forgiveness, does not mean pretending like you aren't hurt. You know, I, I grew up as an, you'll take this on faith, but as an athlete, I played football and wrestled in high school and in college, and so I was sort of conditioned by coaches. You don't show any weakness. You don't let your opponent see that you're hurting, or and you just, you know, you pretend that you're tougher and stronger and better than you actually are. And I have unintentionally sort of adopted that into my spiritual life at times, and it's not good. And it's not biblical at all to pretend like I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine. We wouldn't do that with like a compound fracture, walking around with a bone sticking out of our shin. I'm fine, doesn't hurt, I'm fine, right? So forgiveness is not ignoring the offense. Second, forgiveness is not condoning or excusing the offense. Proverbs 10, 12 tells us that love covers a multitude of sins. We talked about that last week when we dealt with confession. But it doesn't say love excuses or condones a multitude of sins. Sometimes I think those outside of the grace of Jesus who see Christians who forgive horrible things, they think, you're condoning that. You're saying that's okay. No, you're not. Forgiveness is not saying it's okay. So forgiveness is not saying it didn't happen, and forgiveness is not saying that it's okay or I excuse it or condone it. It's a mistake to think that forgiveness means you're saying what, what they did was okay. Number three, and this is a really important one in our culture. Forgiveness is not allowing further abuse. Sometimes we, maybe you grew up thinking it's like you just got to keep taking it and taking it and taking it for Jesus. Turn the other cheek and turn the other cheek. And how many cheeks do you have? I don't know, but you got to keep turning the other cheek. And just get walked on and hurt over and over again. Jesus is not asking us to do that when he calls us to forgive. The biblical vision of forgiveness is not to put a person where they're vulnerable and going to be harmed. I, and I've dealt with people who are in abusive situations, who have this, this assumption that, well, I know it's bad, but I've got to forgive, right? And that means I've got to stay here. I've got to continue to allow myself to be hurt. This is a big room. There are a lot of you here. Across all of our campuses, statistics tell us that it's an, a certainty, statistically speaking, that some of you right here this morning are in abusive relationships. Verbal. Emotional, physical, maybe even sexual abuse. And I just want you to hear me tell you, if that's you, Jesus is not, yes, you are absolutely called to forgive, but that's not your first move. Your first step is to remove yourself from a place where you could be harmed. 
And maybe you don't know how to do that. And so I just want to, I, don't, I think it'd be a, a, I'd be remiss if we didn't say this. And so I just want, you're going to see, maybe you don't know who to talk to. I want to put two email addresses on the screen, two safe people in our church. That if that's you or if it's somebody that you know and you don't know who to reach out to, John Hookinga leads our care ministries. You could email him. Kim Erickson is one of our executive council members. She runs Naomi's house. You could email her. Of course, any of us pastors as well. But forgiveness is not allowing further abuse. Number four, forgiveness is not reconciliation or restoration. This is, a, we get this confused a lot. We think, well, if I forgive, that means I have to go back to the way it was before. We're going to be best friends again. Forgiveness is a one-way street. It's a decision that you make to trust the grace of Jesus to release your hold on somebody. Reconciliation is not a one-way street. It's a two-way street. It requires two people. You can forgive somebody whether or not they receive that, ask for it, or, and you may never be reconciled. I've used this example before many times, but let's just do it again. Let's pretend, Tom, come on up here. Tom doesn't know this is happening. Let's pretend that Tom is, has, has terribly wronged me. He hasn't, but let's pretend that he has. And this Bible represents the wound between us, right? This is, the, this is what he did to me. Hold that, don't let go until I tell you. Most of us think forgiveness works like this. I'll forgive you if you seem sorry enough, Tom, if I think you've suffered like I have, if I think you've, it's been enough time, you know, but I'm not going to let go of this until I think you've paid for it. Okay, you can let go. I'll stay right there. That's not forgiveness. Forgiveness is, Tom, I'm not carrying that anymore. I release my hold on you. I forgive you. Now, Tom may say, forget you, Pastor Jeff. I don't need your forgiveness. We can't be reconciled then. And Tom, Tom, Tom and I are fine. Yes. So, yeah, good, 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 good. Do you see the difference, though? It's very important you get this. God offers us forgiveness in Christ. But not everyone is reconciled to him because you have to receive that by repentance and faith. So you, you could forgive somebody and you may never be, it may never go back to the way it was because you can't control their response. You can't make them acknowledge their wrong. But you can forgive. So while reconciliation is not always possible, forgiveness is always possible. Okay, last, number five, forgiveness is not removing all consequences. Yes, of course, sometimes as Christians we're called to bear the cost and to not pay back evil for evil. But it doesn't mean that there aren't earthly consequences for sin. Sometimes, legal or otherwise, there are unavoidable consequences and that, too, God can use to bring people to repentance and humility. I remember talking to a family years ago who had loaned some money to somebody in our church under the verbal agreement that they would pay that significant sum back to start a business. This person didn't pay it back, ignored them, and avoided them. They came to me to help reconcile this. Love getting those emails. And through a lot of prayer and effort, it just... The, indip the individual was unwilling to talk. And I told this family, sadly, I think you're going to have to chalk this one up to Jesus. You're going to have to release your hold and, you know, say, I, I, this, I, he bears the cost with us. Sometimes there are consequences. That relationship can't be reconciled. Sometimes. Okay, so forgiveness does not mean all of those five things. What does it mean? What is it? There are lots of places we could go. The New Testament, one of the best places is a story Jesus told called the parable of the unforgiving servant. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. Or follow along on the screen. We'll read verses 21 to 35. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord... How many times shall I forgive my brother when he sins against me? Up to seven times? Jesus answered, I tell you not seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. The servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. But when that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii. He grabbed him and began to choke him. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. 
his fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I'll pay you back. But he refused. Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. When the other servants saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master turned him over to the jailers to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. This is how my heavenly father will treat each of you unless you forgive your brother from your heart. Whoa. Whoa. Did you catch the context for the story? Jesus tells this story in response to a question that Peter, one of his disciples, asked. Did you hear it? Now, prior to this, Jesus has been talking about how to confront those who have wronged you, if a brother sins against you. So Peter asked a question, like a follow-up question. He said, okay, Jesus, this whole forgiveness thing is a good idea. I totally get it. But, like, where's the line? How far does it go? How many times should I forgive? Up to seven times? Now, why did he choose seven? Well, we don't know exactly. Seven's a number for perfection. But there's also some reference in the Old Testament, the prophet Amos and other places, where God forgives a, a, a sinful nation up to three times, and then he says, but the fourth time, don't forgive. And so New Testament rabbis had sort of, in the Jesus' day, had taken this idea and made it into like a law. Three times was the requirement, but the fourth time, you don't have to forgive. So maybe Peter thinks he's, I'm more than doubling what the law requires. What the rabbis say. I'm being super gracious and forgiving. Right, Jesus? Up to seven times? Look how forgiving I am. And Jesus says, not seven times, but 70 times seven or 77 times. Now, it says 77 times in the New International Version. Your Bible might say 70 times seven. The King James Version says that. There's some debate, scholars debate, over whether or not this means 77 or 490. But the point is the same. There is no line. You don't put a limit on forgiveness. The edges of grace, I love that song we just, that Daniel sang for us a moment ago. You don't come to the end of it. That's Jesus' point. It's not like you go 75, 76, 77, you're out, right? Or, or 468, 469. No. We're not counting how many times we can, now I can be vengeful. Jesus' point to Peter is, no, no, you're asking the wrong question. There aren't limits here. Now, this parable Jesus tells about a king who forgives his servant a huge debt. We'll talk about that. And the servant, in turn, does not respond to become like his master. He's the opposite. He's incredibly ungracious and unforgiving. And there's this line to drive the point home that Jesus says, which is ought to terrify you a little bit. He says, this is how your father in heaven will treat you unless you forgive your brother or sister. That'll make you squirm. And some of you who have been around here for a while and heard us talk about grace and how we're saved by grace, not through faith, not through works, not through moral behavior, that we're saved by God's grace alone, ought to be thinking, wait a minute, time out, Pastor Jeff. I thought we're saved by the grace of Jesus. How can Jesus then say, if you don't forgive, you're not going to be saved? You're going to be punished or go away to eternal torment if you don't forgive. Isn't that saying we're saved by what we do? Let me be clear about this. Jesus is not saying that if you don't forgive somebody, you're going to hell. That's a mis misreading of what he's saying. He's saying if, you're, if you find that your heart is continually closed to those in need of grace from you, that is a strong indication that your heart has never been open to the grace of Jesus. In a couple of months, it's going to be uh, cool, maybe. We live in Chicago, you never know. October, right? When my kids were little, we used to go apple picking. It's a fun thing to do. I can't make them do it now that they're old. Um, but, you know, you go up to northern Wisconsin, or southern Wisconsin, northern Illinois, you find one of those apple farms, and you walk with your kids, and you look for the tree with all the beautiful, red, delicious apples on it, right? How many of you have done this? I look forward to this. What if you, let's imagine you're walking in one of those apple orchards with your family, and you see one tree, and it's just full of red, delicious apples, and they're just beautiful. And right next to it is another tree that's full of dry branches and brown, crackling leaves. Which tree do you choose? Well, the tree with apples on it. Does the presence of those apples mean that, does that make the tree alive? Do the apples make the tree alive and healthy? No, right? They tell you that there's life and health present there. Conversely, does the absence of apples make the tree dead? No, 
it's only a sign of the deadness that already exists. That's what Jesus is saying here. If you cannot forgive, that's not a good sign, friends. That's a sign of spiritual deadness. That's a sign that there's not the life and the grace of Jesus flowing through you. So what is forgiveness then? The deeper meaning here, what Jesus says, is if you harbor unforgiveness in your heart, if you harbor bitterness in your heart over time, that is actually itself a kind of prison and torment. You know this reference is to thrown in prison and being tortured. It sounds pretty terrifying. There's a spiritual lesson there. You're making your own torture chamber if you can't forgive people. You're putting yourself in a kind of prison. And you're setting yourself on a path of becoming less and less like your gracious and forgiving King Jesus. Okay, so what is forgiveness? I think there's three mechanisms, and, I, and I'm borrowing here from Pastor Timothy Keller uh, on this passage. There's three mechanisms for forgiveness that are right in verse 27. Let me read, him, read verse 27 to you and we'll talk about them. Verse 26, the servant falls on his knees and begs him, be patient, I'll pay everything back. And verse 27, the servant's master, three things, took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. There's a lot in there. Took pity, canceled the debt, and let him go. First step in forgiveness is taking pity. Your Bible might say have compassion or had compassion. That's an interesting Greek word. It's the Greek word splank, nitsomai. It's really fun to say. It means to feel something in your gut or actually it refers to your bowels, but nobody translates that in English because that sounds weird. Right? I love you in my bowels. Who says that, right? It's to feel it in your gut, like gut level feeling. So it means, I, and it doesn't mean a gut level hatred. It means, it's the same word used when, the, when Jesus says, when we're told that Jesus looks on the crowds and he had compassion, splagnitzomai for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew chapter 9. So right here, we're told the master sees the servant that has deep gut level compassion. Lewis Smedes wrote a book called The Art of Forgiveness. It's an old book, but it's really profound. I would, I would recommend it to you if you're just some area you need to grow in. He has a whole chapter on this parable alone. And he says, to take pity or to have compassion is to rediscover the person's humanity. This is really good. Because what happens to us when we don't forgive is that person is no longer a three-dimensional person with nuanced you know, motives and hopes and dreams. They become a flat caricature defined solely by what they did to us. Ever been to a caricature artist like at Six Flags or at Disney World, right? They, what do caricature artists do? They exaggerate. They take one feature of your face and they blow it out of proportion, to, you know, and, and, and usually sometimes it's flattering, most time not, right? We do that spiritually with people that we can't forgive. We blow, we, we, we caricature something they did. And they didn't lie to us, they're a liar, right? But you don't do that with yourself. Do you ever tell a lie? Are you a liar? No, you think, well, yes, it wasn't exactly accurate, but I didn't want to hurt him, and I was trying to make sure that she could receive it. And so I colored the truth, and I spun things, and I shaded it a little bit, right? We give ourselves all kinds of passes, but if somebody lies to us, they're a liar. They become what they did. Our, the glasses through which we see them are solely the thing that they did that hurt us. And the first step in learning to forgive is to see them differently, is to ask for the grace of God to see that they're actually somebody God loves. Yes, they did something terrible, but they're actually somebody God loves. They're actually in need of his grace. To take pity is to revive feelings of compassion, deep compassion for that person, and to desire God's best for them. To pray for them. And not just to pray, Lord, smite them. Right? But to pray, God, bless them. Second step in forgiveness is right here, cancel the debt. And this is the heart of the issue, friends. Canceling the debt. It's the center of the gospel. Okay, so you no longer define them by what they did, but there's still a real debt to pay. There's still a real hurt that's out there. They still did this thing. What do I do with it? In Jesus' story, the servant owes 10,000 talents. Now, you might be new to the world of the New Testament, and that's totally fine. Let me give you a little cultural background here. A talent was the largest unit of, of currency in the Roman Empire. It's actually a unit of weight. 
And so it's hard to calculate exactly how much this was because we're not told if it's weights, talents of gold or silver or some combination. But every scholar agrees this is almost an incalculable sum. It's a crazy amount of money. A, a talent was, one talent was 10 years wages to the average skilled worker. So 10,000 talents, think about that for a minute. Add up 10 years of your, of your salary, multiply it by 10,000. It's, it's well into the billions by today's standards. This is a huge amount of money, which tells us this servant is not a, a butler, not sweeping the floors. This is like a vassal king, an un, a, a lord underneath a great king. And this is a massive amount of money that would do damage to the, uh, the, the king's economy and to his ability to rule and to govern. It puts it at risk. Either by mismanagement or corruption, this guy has lost a massive amount of money. The king cancels the debt. Think about that. What does it mean to cancel the debt? Where does the debt go? Where does it go? Today, you get your report on your 401k or your investments, and it's like, oh, I lost money. I don't know how that happened, but apparently it's like computer magic. I had money. Now I don't have money, right? Not so in the ancient world. There's a real calculable loss here. Where did it go? The king absorbed it. The king absorbed it. He took on that loss and that debt and let the servant go. This is the gospel. You and I owe an incalculable debt of sin. And your king Jesus absorbs it at the cross, in his body, by his blood. The debt doesn't go away. Somebody always pays. Even if it's not financial, there's emotional cost. There's relational cost. There's only two options. Either you're going to pay it or you're going to try to make them pay it. Even if it's privately, right? Do you ever do this? Like you secretly wish for them to have a terrible life? I don't say anything bad about them, but I sort of rejoice if I hear they're not doing so great. What's that doing to your soul? Somebody's paying. To cancel a debt means... I'm going to absorb that. I'm going to, I'm going to ask for the grace of Jesus to take that on and not try to make them pay. Think about the sum of money for a minute and go back to what the servant says. Be patient. I'll pay it back. How ridiculous. 10,000 times 10 years, you're going to pay that back? Really? Not in a million lifetimes. Which is precisely Jesus' point. You can't pay it. And this is what makes the third step in forgiveness possible. Let them go. You let them go. How does that happen? When you begin to see them as more than what they did to you and rediscover their humanity and feel compassion for them, and by God's grace, you're able to absorb the cost yourself because he strengthens you and he sustains you and you don't try to make them pay in your heart. You're releasing your hold on them. Remember that analogy with Tom, right? Play this emotional tug of war for years, and nobody's free. I'm not, and he's not. But slowly, by God's grace, I can let him go. Let him go. And what happens is you become the free one when you're able to do that. Now, the truth is, the Bible says that you actually must grant forgiveness before you feel forgiving. Most of us think it works the other way around, don't we? Well, I'm not ready yet. I'm not, I, don't, I can't forgive him yet. I'm still holding on to this one. The Bible says, no, no, you, you don't wait around until you feel like it. You grant it, and you grant it, and you forgive, 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 and then after that, you forgive, and slowly your heart and your emotions catch up. And the truth is, sometimes we have to do this over and over and over again, don't we? Only God forgives once for all, right? Removes our sins as far as the east is from the west and takes them away. It's a process for us. C.S. Lewis uh, wrote a book, uh, well, there's a book of his letters. He wrote letters to his childhood friend named Arthur Greaves, and the book is called They Stand Together. It's a great read, these letters back and forth. And Lewis talks about 40 years after the event. So he was in boarding school, like a lot of like all children in, in his era in, in the U.K. And he, he was abused by a very messed up headmaster at the Wynyard School. 
He doesn't talk about what kind of abuse. It was physical, sexual, or, or, or emotional, or some combination. But it was pretty significant. You can tell that by the context of his letters. And he said, 40 years later, he's a grown man, Oxford Don, and he's walking through Oxford, and he thought, this is way behind him, hasn't thought about this guy in years, and something triggers his memory. Has this ever happened to you? Something out of the blue triggers his memory of those horrific days of abuse. And he said he had to sit down on a park bench in Oxford, shaking with rage, and forgive the whole thing all over again. Can you relate to that? And he said, I was dismayed. I thought I was over this, and I realized I have to forgive the whole offense again. And then he writes, the way that I know I'm making progress is when the length of time between those remembrances and the intensity of them becomes longer and less. I know God is healing my heart. I know he's setting me free. To forgive and forgive and forgive. Lewis writes in an essay on forgiveness, to forgive once is no real trick, but to keep forgiving every time the offense is remembered. That is the real challenge. And we cannot do it but for the grace of God. Again, Lewis writes in the same essay, to be a Christian means to forgive the inexcusable in others because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Remember the debt that the servant owes, crazy 10,000 talents? Then he goes and finds a servant. He finds him and chokes him and says, and the guy owes him 100 denarii, 100 days wages. Not small, but nothing compared to what he was forgiven. And he won't let him go. Throws him in prison. That's a, Jesus saying, that's how you are. If you can't forgive, you're saying, I'm a higher tribunal than God. And what you did to me is worse than what I did to God. That's the height of arrogance and spiritual pride. This is so radically unlike our world today, isn't it? Think about our world today. Just think about Twitter. Don't you love Twitter? When's the last time you heard somebody on Twitter, read someone who's accused or shamed or mocked say, you know, you're right about that. I'm going to do some soul searching. And by the way, that hurt me, but I want you to know how much I forgive you for your harshness. And I pray for you. I've never seen it. Not politically, not... <laughs> And I think there's people in our culture who when they see Christians forgiving horrific offenses, it's confusing. It's unsettling. It doesn't make sense. Paul tells us the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. There's something about the grace of God that should unsettle us. Make us go, really, you can forgive that? You'll see an image here of a church this is the Emanuel American Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina, historic black church. On June 17th, 2016, 21-year-old white supremacist Dylan Roof sat in the parking lot until after 9 p.m. when a prayer service had ended, then walked into that church calmly with an automatic weapon, shot and killed nine people. Nine African-American Jesus followers murdered because of racial hatred. He said he was trying to incite a race war. Just a few days after this horrific incident, event, the daughter of one of the victims, a woman named Nadine Collier, stood in front of TV cameras and microphones and addressed the man who killed her mother. You can read it, but I'm going to read it for you. What she, this is a, an excerpt from what she said. It's on YouTube. You can go listen to her whole speech. She said, I forgive you. I want everyone to know that. You took away someone very precious from me. I will never get to talk to her again. I'll never be able to hold her again. But I forgive you. I pray God would have mercy on you. You hurt me more than words can say. You hurt a lot of people. But if God can forgive you, I forgive you. What kind of love is that? What kind of love makes that possible? There's only one. It's the love of the king who's canceled an infinite debt for you. A debt you could not work off in a million lifetimes. He has compassion on you because he loves you. 
He cancels your debt and he sets you free. And he calls us to be like him in the world. So here's your challenge this week. We've been giving you spiritual challenges each week. Here's your challenge should you choose to accept it. I know everyone in this room has something to forgive and something to be forgiven of. Most likely multiple things in both categories. But your challenge is to speak to your father, the king who has set you free, and ask him. You probably already know what it is. If you've been holding back forgiveness from somebody, don't let this week end without you extending it. And if you know you, you've been too stubborn in pride to ask for forgiveness for someone that you've wronged, you've been excusing yourself for a long time, don't let this week end without you asking for it. Because your king has forgiven you an infinite debt. He absorbed the cost because he loves you and he sets you free. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we, we, in so many ways, we underestimate the debt we owe and we overestimate the wrongs done to us. We get this wrong. We ask that you would realign our hearts, open our eyes, that we might see those who have hurt us the way you see them. People who you love in desperate need of your grace. People like us. Thank you for the grace you shower on us every day for the unpayable debt and the cost that you absorbed. Help us to be like you in the world, gracious, forgiving, full of love and mercy. We thank you. We praise you in your name. Amen.